afternoon. Welcome to the digital trade session. It's so good to see a packed house. I uh, hope your first day at AMNC is going well. Can I have a show of hands? If this is your first AMNC, can you raise your hand? Wow, quite a bit. Uh, hope you guys have a great experience. Um, if you have any feedback, please let us know, but there's no refund to the tickets. So. <laughs> Uh, my name is Ziyang Fan. I am the head of digital trade at the World Economic Forum. I'm based in San Francisco at the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Same, uh, we're also in the room. This room is called San Francisco. It's by design, by the way. So, so you, you won't get lost. Um, in the, uh, so we're here to talk about digital trade. International trade has been, let's say, a hot topic recently, uh, including today, if you're following the news, right? We talk about trade, there's a lot of uncertainties. But I think you know, a lot of discussions on trade being evolving around tariffs, you know, take for, take, take for tech tariff. But I think when it comes to international trade, we're missing an important part of the conversation, which is digital trade, right? Digital trade, digital, uh, trading of digital goods and services, and also using uh, technology for trade has been a growing part of international trade. Digital trade is now 12% of international trade and growing. When it comes to, for, to uh, cross-border data flows, uh, the, uh, the amount, the volume of data increased uh, nine-folds in the past 10 years, and is expected to increase another five-folds in, in the next five years. So especially with four, uh, more 4 IR technologies coming down the road, when you think about autonomous vehicles, when you talk about IoT devices, when you talk about AIs, the amount of data that will be generated for both the trading of digital goods and services will be tremendous. Uh, but not everything's rosy, right? And a lot of um, barriers and challenges for digital trade, from outdated regulations to lack of policies and uh, uh, laws, or to different views, for example, on cross-border data flows. So how do we tackle those challenges? That's what we're trying to do here at the Digital Trade uh, Project at the uh, World Economic Forum. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, we were established a year ago in San Francisco. The whole idea is that emerging technologies, AI, blockchain, etc., the development of technologies, the speed of that technology have far outpaced the current laws and regulations, and there's a huge gap in between. Right? And that's what we're trying to do is to close that gap. And we do that by co-designing with governments and the private sector through the multi-stakeholder process uh, at the forum. In particular, at the digital trade uh, portfolio, we focus on a couple of projects. One on digital payment. So for those of you in China, you will see that mobile payment is everywhere. You can buy everything <laughs> right? uh, uh, from a street stand, including uh, using a mobile pay payment. But that's not the case worldwide. So for a country X wants to accelerate the adoption of digital payment, what kind of policy a policy uh, initiatives need to put in place, right? One, and two, on cross-border data flows. It, that's, a, that's a really tough one. How do you strike the balance of, on the one hand, encouraging data flows cross-borders, right? But also protecting privacy and security. Where do you strike that balance? A lot of uh, recent developments from GDPR to CBPR is being uh, on that topic. And we also have a, a discussion paper on that for your reference. So. Lastly, uh, uh, um, digitization of trade, you'll see, um, using technologies for trade. So, but overall, this is an opportunity for us to have this conversation, to hear this distinguished panel, and also from you. So, look forward and uh, uh, have a great discussion today. Thank you. I'll introduce you to, well, <laughs> Professor Richard Baldwin, who is the moderator. Thank you very much. So, I, have, I think I have a time mic here. So let me add my welcome to you. Uh, it's, this is a time when technology is changing realities uh, at a pace that most of us just aren't used to. Uh, I've recently wrote about the holy cow moment when in, in principle, you know, this has been coming for 40 years at the same pace, the same exponential pace, but for some reason or now, the increments are so large that it's changing realities ways that shock us, even though we should have known better. This particular panel is on digital trade, which is one very important part of it. Digital trade, as you probably will have noticed, is a very vague word. It's hard to know what it means, and I think that's done on purpose. What I'd like this panel mostly to be discussing, because we can't do everything, 
is to talk about how do we keep digital trade rolling? How do we allow it to benefit societies? But take account of the fact that there will be some downsides of it, and we have to worry about inclusiveness, and we have to worry about uh, things like security and privacy and different uh, cultural attitudes towards uh, privacy and whatnot. So uh, the panel we have today is perfect for this. It was very well chosen to be a bit of everything that we need. I'm just going to say their names and who they work for. You all have the biography there, uh, not to waste time on, on the introductions. Yasi, and, and excuse me, I grew up in the Midwest, so I cannot pronounce names that, that aren't like you know Robert Owen or something. Um, <laughs> Uh, Yasushi Akahoshi is the president of Jetro. Uh, Jorge Abrache is the uh, uh, minister uh, in Brazil. Uh, I forgot to write down of what, which is the industry? In, in Ministry of Planning. Ministry of Planning, yes, of course. And one of the most famous uh, uh, economists in South America. Daphne Huang uh, works for Swift. Uh, Li Shidong. Uh, is a professor uh, here in, in China dealing with all digital trade things. Not and finally, we have Susan Ning, who is a, a legal expert, uh, especially on digital things. So the way we're going to do this is I will first ask each of them a question, and I have four minutes to sort of lay things out from the different perspectives, uh, governance, uh, business, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll have something of a panel discussion and we're going to leave some time at the end, 10 minutes at least, for Q&A, because one of the things I've always noticed at these World Economic Forum events is often the smartest people are in the audience, not up here on the panel. <laughs> so we have to leave lots of time for, for comments and, and questions from, from the panel. So let me just get straight into that uh, and start with uh, Yasushi, Yasushi. I don't know why. And I understand you're going to talk a little bit about inclusiveness in digital trade. Yes. yes. Please. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm delighted to be here with all of you. And uh, this is actually uh, my third participation to uh, Summer Davos. And uh, in the last uh, two uh, meetings, uh, I uh, discussed uh, digital trades. And there, uh, I have been always uh, emphasizing uh, the importance uh, of or importance of forming uh, rules uh, on digital trade. Uh, but uh, last year's uh, ministers, ministerial meetings, uh, which discuss uh, the rule making uh, for digital trade, uh, was launched in the end of last year uh, by culture by Japan, Singapore, and Australia. And uh, recently, China joined. Uh, so uh, in these areas, uh, the uh, things are moving ahead. Uh, so this time around, uh, I'd like to touch upon inclusive, inclusive issue of inclusiveness issues a bit. Uh, first one is uh, coverage. Uh, more than 4 billion people uh, on the globe. Uh, actually, it's half, more than half of the population of the world. Uh, cannot link to the internet. And, uh, basically, uh, that is uh, the so-called last one mile issues, or last five, or last ten miles issues, uh, whatever. Uh, in this regard, uh, Indian government uh, set up uh, common service centers, uh, CSC, uh, all over the countries, uh, which is a kind of uh, digital kiosk uh, which offer the function of, of digital banking, uh, digital teachers, and the digital uh, doctors, and so on and so forth, uh, with uh, dedicated uh, computers uh, and instructors there. So that uh, is a good uh, example or exercise uh, for this uh, last uh, one mile issues. And the second is, uh, I'd like to touch upon another issues uh, which even exist in developing countries like Japan's uh, digital divide. Uh, for example, uh, we are facing a serious uh, aging societies and uh, the population more than 65 years old uh, account for 30% uh, of Japanese populations. And uh, 
not all, uh, but uh, most of them uh, live with a real economy, not digital, like uh, local retail shops. And uh, while uh, digital economies are ex expanding, those real economies uh, have been shrinking. And uh, those elderly peoples uh, may not be able to cap uh, cap uh, catch up with uh, the development of digital trade. So if don't we do uh, anything, uh, the real, uh, seamless, uh, or sustainable uh, digital trade or digital economy uh, cannot uh, be realized. So we have to think about something uh, for those peoples. And maybe uh, one solution uh, may be uh, to uh, take advantage of the fruits uh, of uh, fourth industrial revolution, uh, such as uh, automatic uh, driving or AI. Uh, that is uh, possible pollution, uh, but uh, this is a kind of serious question. I stop here for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist is, is Jorge, and I think it would be really great if you could sort of share a developing country uh, perspective with this. There's definitely a sort of north-south issue going on with digital trade, so please. Oh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm, I'm actually vice minister, not minister, not yet. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, let me uh, share some thoughts uh, with you about this, this very key topic. It, it is indeed uh, a game changer. The, the digital economy is, is here. Uh, it, it is changing everything. It is changing the way we interact, the way we produce things, the way we manage production, the way the, the things that we, we consume, the B2B, the B2C, everything. So it is in definitely a game changer. And, uh, but there are, some, uh, there are several perspective, uh, perspectives that should be taken into account. One of them is related to, to, uh, to network and platform ethics. Uh, it, it is uh, becoming more and more visible the fact that uh, uh, fewer and fewer companies are dominating the markets. Uh, so there is a clear market consolidation in the internet economy, being e-commerce, being uh, several types of platforms, so that it is changing uh, uh, the, 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 the definition of competition yeah, even in, in affecting startups, affecting uh, 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 companies, even uh, impacting uh, the incentives for uh, doing more and better in terms of uh, creating uh, new solutions. So this is one issue. An another issue is related to, to regulations and, and to technical standards. Of course, uh, one of the main things that uh, is preventing uh, the, uh, the, the digital economy to become even more popular, uh, including developing economies, is uh, related to, well, there are many things uh, what they, they, they are called enablers, including uh, infrastructure, network, and all these things. But uh, one important aspect is, is, is the, regu uh, the regulatory and, and technical standards. The thing related to this topic, uh, my concern is that uh, regulations and technical standards are not neutral. They are not neutral. If you pick this type of regulations and, and technical standards, you may, uh, there is a kind of a trade-off, and there is always a cost, it's especially if you are a follower, such as most of the developing economies. And one important aspect related to that is the fact that uh, depending on, on what decisions are, and, uh, and these days uh, the WTO is just starting to discuss the e-commerce agenda and the, the digital economy uh, as a whole, I would say. And depending on the decisions and, and on the type of, uh, of standards and technical regulations and technical standards that are uh, uh, discussed there, uh, the, the room for maneuver for a developing economy to do more and better may be affected. Mm -hmm. And, and this, is, this is concerning. And, and my final com uh, comment is related to leapfrogging. If, in the one hand, uh, the digital economy uh, can be indeed a very, very important tool 
for developing economies uh, to leapfrog in several areas. Uh, on the other hand, uh, depending on all these things that I have just mentioned, competition, market consolidation, network and platform effects, and, and, and regulatory and technical standards, uh, developing economies in general may not have this room for maneuver to uh, become part of, of the development, of the digital, the digital economy development, and eventually to do uh, more in terms of uh, income prospects and in, in, in economic growth in the medium to long term. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So next we're going to go with uh, Daphne Huang, who uh, works for SWIFT. Uh, the worldwide payment network, which is in, in some sense, I like to call it the container ships of digital trade. We could not do any of this if you can't pay for it, and, and uh, your organization is really the backbone of it. So please, how, if you would uh, contribute on the payment side, uh, which I guess it brings us more into e-commerce than many other things, so please. So I think first, uh, thanks for you know, inviting SWIFT uh, to actually attend this session. I just you know, one quick question to the audience in this room. How many actually people you know about SWIFT? Where are we domicile? Oh, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so normally actually when we're actually you know, talking about this, many actually people think we are American company, but in fact we are not. We actually domicile in Brussels, and we are independent, neutral, and uh, it's a member-owned uh, cooperatives serving the financial community globally. Yeah. So speaking of the digital trade, obviously, you know, when, when we look into the, this, we are actually looking for the really actually from the end to end, uh, uh, the trade uh, uh, the experience. So not only focus on the, the trade, the front end itself, but also we also focus on the post trade. That's including the uh, post, uh, uh, post trade payment processing and uh, traders risk supply chain management, et cetera. So particularly, you know, we see that challenging, you know, from the post-trade payment processing. And then um, we switched uh, two years ago, we start to address these challenges and then work together uh, with the global, uh, our uh, global banks, our member banks, uh, to actually really solve this, actually, uh, the, the challenges and come up with a solution. We call it the GPI, Global Payment Innovation. And then that actually can solve the, you know, the, really the challenging thing, you know, around three areas. That is about the speed, transparency, and traceability, as well as the information. Was the first, the first one was what? I didn't... Sorry, speed. Speed. Yeah. Transparency. And traceability. Yes. So, so you know, I think many of us actually, we have that experience when we actually do the one cross-border payment, we actually you know, usually take a couple of days to actually, you know, to uh, the beneficiary side to be received. And then, of course, you know, during the payment processing, we have no idea how much you know, cost will be deducted from this payment. And of course, you know, we have no idea about the information, the payment status information. So that is you know, very much you know, challenging when we actually come to, the, you know, uh, to dealing with the, the, the payment process. So GPI, you know, when we actually launched this uh, last year for, uh, in May, that's, you know, I mean, the, um, this actually service being launched, you know, to the, uh, the global financial community, we actually um, all together in four cities to actually, uh, to actually you know, make this actually, you know, the formal launch in Beijing, um, Singapore, Frankfurt, and New York. And then that's, you know, as soon as we launched this service in the market, it's just been highly recommended and recognized by our member banks. And then up today, uh, when we actually observe that, the GPI actually you now become the very revolutionary payment service to the global financial community. And then we see that up today, the average the message, GPI message, is being up to 100 billion US dollar in total the, on a daily basis. And of course, you know, the, um, it's around, you know, the, the number of the, actually the GPI uh, message and the, the uh, banks will join that is actually changing every day in a very, you know, we call it a, a, a crazy speed. Yeah, because that actually does actually bring the benefit to the, the, the banks to actually, you know, to enhance their, um, the customer experience in payment. Yeah. 
So we also see that, you know, I mean, up to now, is that it's over 250 banks globally already joined the GPI community. And then that represents 85% of the global payment. In China, we also observed around nearly uh, by end of this year, we expect around 100 banks will join GPI. And those actually 100 banks will represent nearly 95% of total payment message, total payment volume in China when we actually come to the cross border. So that's just pretty, you know, uh, uh, a big initiative, a big innovation to the financial community when we actually, you know, trying to address this challenge. And this is the solution. We work together with the financial community. Yeah, that is something actually, you know, from payment perspective, and when we come to the digital trade, and then that's actually how we actually you know, observe that and how we come up with the solution to actually help the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is a professor, uh, a fellow academic, a broad thinker uh, on the digital economy as a whole, Li Xiangdong. And I thought maybe if we could just get four minutes of your broader vision of where digital economy is going or actually anything you really want to talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's a professor cannot dis discuss anything. <laughs> but but I think it's for the digital economy and the digital trade now is a, is a, I think it's a, to be a hot topic again because of the, the there's some new technologies to be ready for that. So as as we discussed for the forum, there's uh, we faced the. Uh, the Two uh, areas. One is that uh, is the fourth industrial revolution, and uh, and also for the supporting technology is internet, but 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 for it, internet itself, is also go to the surface for the internet of value. So why we we call the internet of value? The first phase is in internet of data packet, and the second phase is the internet of information, and the third phase now is the internet of value. It's because of the digital trade. And also because of the blockchain technologies. So, uh, so many people want to use blockchain technology to be the core protocol to enable the internal value. So I, I just heard so, so many information from you expert. So, but I think now that for digital trade, if we want the digital trade can increase maybe five times uh, in the next four or five years, I think there's a lot of issue to be resolved. The, the most important thing is the, for the data protection. You know, that mean if you have a lot of trade based on the internet, that means you will contribute so many data, including your personal data and, and also the transaction data. So, but there's a lot of argument uh, and, uh, uh, to discuss who own the data, who can use the data, and who, how to use the data. So now there is so many uh, policies to be discussed or to be published, just like the GDPR is a very strict policy for the data protection. But I, I don't know the GDPR is the good news or bad news for the future digital trade. But uh, let's look at what will be happening in the next few years. But I think it's, uh, even in China, there's a lot of discussion about that. So, but, but for the industry, don't want a very strict policy. But for the people, they maybe want some pro protection for that data. So, so I think now there's a big challenge. If the, the government have a very strict policy, maybe they will street, uh, uh, stop the increasing for the digital treaty for five times in the next four years. But if the people want strict protection, but they also want to get a benefit for the digital trade, I think it's, it's very difficult for people to find the balance point. And also for the industry, you know, even the industry want to get loose uh, policy for the digital trade, but it's also a big challenge for the big internet company to protect the, the, the user's data. So, so it a, means a very big cost for their future trade. So I think in the current stage is very critical time for us. Yeah how to make sure that the private sector, the government, and also the, the academia professors or civil society can work together to find a balance point for the uh, very fundamental, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, very fundamental infrastructure platform, uh, especially for the, for the, for the uh, balance point for the policy making. Yeah. 
that's, that's, I think it's a very overview uh, point for, for your discussion. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you very much. It is indeed something we could talk about the whole rest of the week, taking every little bit and putting it out, but that was a... Just a follow your order. Excellent, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Now, we have Susan Ning, who is a, has a, a, a lawyer dealing with uh, digital things. Now, one of the things we heard many times is rules and uh, conflicts between jurisdictions uh, are a big issue. Is that something you can shed some light on to open up the discussion there? Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you for the forum uh, inviting me to speak on these topics. <clears throat> First of all, when we talk about digital trade, I think like uh, it could be, as uh, Richard, you, at the opening you mentioned, it could be interpreted in many ways. But since the discussion here, we are talking about trade, which could be digitalized, meaning that it's still traditional trade. We are buying things. And uh, I think at the beginning, Ziyang was mentioning there was an increase of 12% over the last year uh, for, the, uh, for the increase uh, uh, for the digital trade versus the whole uh, volume of international trade. Uh, but I think I need to verify whether it's a to be or to see. Uh, I don't know, but I think like a most concerned part probably is a to see part, because the international trade, if we were talking about to be part, no matter it's a domestic or international, uh, that's like a, in bigger volume. But it, actually, the most like a influential is actually to see part. In China, from my personal uh, experience, I think I'm doing most of my purchasing now, even furniture even you know heavy stuff I do it online so for me it could be 90% of my personal trade so far is, in the, uh, is online this actually just a bring new issues versus the traditional so-called trade uh, because like uh, taking the uh, to see uh, as an example there is a third party in uh, in between the platform like uh, Alibaba like uh, JD like uh, other like uh, e-commerce uh, platform and this platform is so fundamental that like, um, no matter as a customer individual or as a business operator selling goods, we need them. We need them as a platform, as an entrance to meet the other side. So how could, uh, uh, like, uh, in such a scenario, first of all, how to protect the welfare, the benefit of individual customers with the third party in between? It's unlike the, uh, the traditional like a shopping center. Uh, it has covered certain, certain uh, function of it, but actually has more. As uh, Xiaozhong uh, put it, like, uh, the security issue, the uh, privacy issue, a lot of uh, data is not only concerning that in individual, but a lot of uh, transactional data is so held by the uh, platform. So how to identify the individual rights which should be protected not only by the seller, the business operator, but as well as the uh, platform of operator. That has been an issue that uh, like a legal society has been discussing. We have, in China, we have uh, uh, the new e-commerce law that has been recently promulgated and that will be in, uh, enacted next year on the 1st of January 2019. In that, uh, uh, in that particular piece of uh, legislation, the protection of data, uh, including uh, privacy data, uh, transactional data, has been regulated and the uh, platform has been informed uh, more uh, obligation than they expected. Like uh, after the law was, in, uh, was promulgated, that the platform uh, operators, they, they complained so much, meaning that they have been imposed. But nevertheless, I think that uh, 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 together with uh, the e-commerce issue, not only, actually, just for your information, the draft of this e-commerce law, actually, the ma major members, are, are the drafters for the cybersecurity law, <laughs> actually. So actually, you know, that's why you could see a lot of uh, protection of uh, personal information and uh, uh, transaction data was there imposed to protect the consumer's uh, um, 
uh, interest. But nevertheless, when we, you know, talking about the platform economy, when we talk about e-commerce, we always, always have to think about payments. We, like uh, Daphne has mentioned, we always have to talk about the uh, logistics. Actually, these two, online payment and log logistics, have been, uh, have been like a very much developed in China, like in, in Beijing at least. Uh, I can just live without the cash in my pocket just easily. I can even pay the, uh, the, the street food easily, you know, just for five, five RMB easily. Even my parking ticket, like uh, if I'm parking there, like uh, when I go, like I paid a couple of uh, RMB, I pay with my WeChat or Alipay. So I think payment logistics has been like uh, well developed, but uh, of course for the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the entrance or access issue, then uh, that's, uh, that's also an issue that uh, how to, because uh, now, especially with some incidents happening with the like, uh, uh, big, uh, big players in the sharing economy or in some other, I, I wouldn't mention the name, then the, uh, the, the complaint about the monopolized entrance to platform has been complained and uh, people are really w watch and see what's going to happen there. And that will be uh, uh, not only an e legal issue, but a, a policy issue as well. So I, I will just pause here, sorry. Thank you very much with that. So what I'd like to do now is pick up on a couple of the themes that you mentioned and get more of a panel discussion. And I'll, I'll start with the end there um, because it's something that, that touches on forum kind of ideas, multi-stakeholders. Let me just put it sort of starkly. Um, there really is no possible perfect solution to the privacy versus liberalization. It's just security, privacy, whatever. There's no, but we have now two very clear uh, anchors, the GDPR of the European Union and the Chinese one. And before there's, there's TPP is someone, the US doesn't have one yet. So are we in a world of inevitable fragmentation of rules? that will hinder commerce, or is there some way this is all gonna work out? Let me start out with Jorge, put you on the spot. No, thank you. Uh, that's, that's a really great question. Uh, uh, and it's, it goes back to a point that I tried to make here, and that is, uh, if you indeed follow one of these, let's say, frameworks, you, it may end up uh, impacting the way you will do business with others. So uh, I think that the, the, the main point here is related to the non-neutrality of, of, uh, of these frameworks. So, uh, and uh, uh, my sense is that one of the main reasons behind uh, 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 the, the, the trade war is related precisely to this type of, of point. Uh, there is a, actually a, a war between uh, uh, regulatory and, and technical standards taking place right now. And whoever wins will get most of the, that's the economy of the, of, of the superstars. Let, let, let me push you on that. Is it absolutely win-lose, zero sum? Well, I, I mean, there are, there are many standards in autos, for example, huh? and it hasn't destroyed the market. Uh, f f so le let me just move, uh, at, at Shushi, you think it's really impossible that there's more common rules or that we live with different sets of rules? What, what is your thinking on the competition between the rules takers and the rules makers, so to speak? I think, uh, I guess, uh, let me put it in the phase. Uh, in the phase of uh, trade of goods, uh, there is a principle, a clear principle of uh, free trade. And uh, as an exception, uh, we agreed on security control or uh, etc. Uh, but uh, in the phase of uh, digital trade, uh, I even don't know uh, GDPR versus free flow of data such kind of formulation is correct or not. And actually, it's, uh, in TPP, as you mentioned, uh, we establish uh, common rules uh, for free flow of data, and uh, uh, you just uh, publicize uh, GDPR, and uh, we agreed uh, the Japan-EU EPS uh, recently, but uh, uh, we don't have any rules 
uh, in Japan EU EPA. So uh, I haven't uh, come up with a clear idea, but uh, uh, in the future, uh, I'm cautiously optimizing, or we have to work hard uh, to establish uh, something uh, which cover all interests or concerns all over the world. And uh, that's what uh, our uh, framework, uh, which uh, has been held in Geneva, uh, is trying to do so. Thank you very much. So Lee, let me just go back to you. You laid out the trade-offs that are stark and clear between rules, privacy, et cetera. Do you think uh, that the competing sets of rules can ever live together, or is it really uh, mutually exclusive, or will it be like the plugs where you know you just have a little piece of plastic and each plug works everywhere? Uh, what is your view for how global governance of these kind of data issues will go, or should go? Yes, I think it's a, that's just that I mentioned now is a very uh, critical time because there's so many uh, uh, new policies was published to protect the, the, the data or, or defend the e-commerce. I think it's just to publish a new law in China, e-commerce law. So we need, need more practice to, to see what will happen if you apply this law into the, the current uh, digital trade. So, but you know, uh, I think it's, there's a lot of issues. The, the big issue is is how to make sure we can have the supporting technology to support the, the, the deployment of the law. I, I don't think that the current technology is a major to, to, to support the laws. So just like that, you know, you know, everything will be digitalized with data. And how to make sure the data is trustworthy. How to make sure that the transaction is secure. How to make sure my data can be reliable storage how to make sure that my data can be appropriately uh, maybe computing or, or, or applied. So there's a lot of, lot of issues. I don't think that the current law so uh, satisfies everything. And, and also, as I mentioned, the technology need to be improved. Yeah. So, so of course, as you also mentioned, that the model is stay, stakeholder. That means the government want, want more control. And the people want more protection. And the, the, the industry want more data. Right? <laughs> so I think it's, it's right, because they, they, they just represent their interest. But how to make sure they can collaborate each other? Try to think about on the other side. Absolutely, yeah. But so just this is a general question to the, to the panelists. And actually, if anybody in the audience really knows the answer. Um, is it possible for companies, the big companies, to live with all these different data regulations? How difficult would it be for them to just do GDPR in the EU and TPP in the TPP countries and the Chinese regulations? How difficult would that be? Can we, can't we just live with it? Do we really do need to harmonize them? What, what is your thinking? You want to? We have an example of, of the SWIFT who have actually they, <laughs> they all agreed a rule. You must have exactly the same issues on payments, security, privacy, quick, what did you say? Yeah. Quick, transparent, and traceable. And somehow or another, you came up with one set of rules. I, I suspect it's because you came up with the rules before it exploded. And what we now have is an explosion, and we're trying to give it rules afterwards. But yes, yeah, so first of all, from a SWIFT perspective, we do actually not, uh, really actually uh, stick to the principle which is, you know, we uh, really actually, you know, uh, protect the customers' uh, um, the privacy, the data, uh, the confidentiality. So that is uh, the principle of SWIFT. And then certainly, I think, you know, speaking about GDPR, I mean, the, you know, as we actually domicile in Brussels, obviously, you know, we also have to actually, you know, comply with that, uh, uh, the rule as well. And from what we actually observe, uh, especially in Europe, from payment perspective, yeah, we see that some actually the non-bank, uh, the payment service provider, they actually provide uh, the payment service and or, or tools to some e-commerce platform. And then even with the permission, they can access to banking, the bank's the customer's data directly. Mm -hmm. So that is actually some, actually the, uh, the, some movement uh, uh, we actually observe. And of course, you know, in China, we also see there's some actually the major bank they add a lot with uh, uh, the, some uh, third-party payment giants as well. 
to um, sort of the covering, like uh, uh, the, the co-share the data, and uh, or the customer profiling, recent analysis. So we see that the uh, uh, the L line, you know, I mean, like you know, the Bank of China with Tencent, yeah, they actually, you know, I mean, the uh, sort of kind of like you know, formalize uh, strategic cooperation in that area. ICBC with uh, Jingdong, and of course it's CCB, the China Construction Bank, with uh, uh, the Ens Financial. So then, of course, you know, we see that you know the one way is about the uh, in the industry, like uh, you know, Professor Lee just mentioned about the, you know the participant or the market participant, they would like to actually make good use of the data uh, as good as possible. But on the other hand, we do need to consider how we're going to actually really protect the customers, uh, uh, the data confidentiality and privacy, without the, you know, the, without compromising that. Perfect. So that's actually, you know, it's, a, it's like a, how we're going to strike the balance of that. So certainly, you know, that would be actually inter interesting for all of us to actually to think further. Thank you, thank you. So I'd like to move on to another theme which came up in many of your comments, which is a sort of inclusiveness. And uh, many of you mentioned how the digital trade is creating, in some sense, a digital divide. Uh, many of you mentioned the sort of north versus south or particular really two countries in the world have big platforms already uh, and everybody else doesn't. So there is that, it's not just north-south, it's actually very, very specific. But also you mentioned the generational divide. The young people are, are all, you know, you've, you've probably all done it. You, you're, you don't know how to use the, the control for the TV and, you know, your six-year-old niece go, comes along and it works. So there is this digital divide that's within countries and I think also rural versus urban. So this is the, the forum where we're committed to improving the state of the world. What can we do to prevent this from fragmenting or encourage inclusivity? Maybe I'll start again with your, your Jorge, because I think this was something you were, you were hinting at, but, but you didn't say, what are we gonna do about it? Thank you. Well, I, I think that you, uh, you mentioned a very key uh, aspect of, of the digital economy, which is the, dig the, the digital divide. I think that in the end of the day, you, you end up with kind of uh, two uh, categories of, or, or two groups of, of, of countries. One is composed by those that are users of, of, of technologies. They are adopters of those technologies, developed, managed, and distributed by, the, by others. So uh, there is a kind of uh, 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 a discussion or uh, a discussion should be put on the table about this thing. Uh, uh, the users are these days trying to become a kind of a qualified user of uh, the digital economy, meaning trying to have access to uh, applications, trying to have access to, to better networks, trying to have access to the, late, uh, the, the latest generation of whatever technology. However, you have the other countries who are the ones that are developing, distributing, and managing these technologies. And this thing is making a huge difference in terms of economic prospects, in terms of creating value, in terms of creating good jobs, in terms of creating all the conditions for, uh, for the economy to boom. So uh, this is perhaps uh, the most concerning aspect. Uh, and we have uh, uh, actually to discuss how to make uh, uh, users, not only users, but kind of uh, a participant in the, a participant in, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, the community of those that are developing technologies and, and, and sharing these technologies. Absolutely. So uh, Yasushi, uh, what is the solution to the digital divide within countries, a generation? Is it to get more connectivity out into the rural regions? Is it training? Is it uh, adaptation of the applications? What, what is, is the Japanese government doing anything to encourage inclusivity inside the generations, inside the country? Well, uh, it's a very difficult question. And, uh, <coughs> uh, well, uh, the Again, let me put it this way. Uh, in, in our countries, uh, both private sectors and the public sectors uh, have been advocate, ad, advocating 
uh, the concept, uh, so-called Society 5.0, uh. and uh, uh, which uh, is the new societies uh, taking advantage of the fruits of uh, 4IR uh, to solve uh, social issues uh, like uh, healthcare and uh, health cares and uh, so on and so forth. And so, in such ways, uh, I guess uh, we would be able to come up with good solutions uh, again, uh, thanks to the uh, 4IR, uh, to, to include uh, those people uh, who may be uh, left uh, behind. Uh, but uh, I don't have a right answer at this moment. And another aspect is to to have, uh, as I mentioned, as I mentioned in my in the first round, uh, I put emphasis of real economies. Uh, it's not something like again real economies versus digital economies, uh, but uh, uh, for example, uh, we were uh, struck by massive earthquake in Hokkaido recently, and uh, so were uh, the Hong Kong and. Uh, uh, Philippines uh, by typhoon and the US uh, by hurricane and uh, uh, it's uh, damage uh, the uh, infrastructure infrastructures uh, which uh, is the foundation of uh, digital uh, economy so uh, when we discuss digital economy uh, we are inclined to focus on just uh, just cutting edge, cutting edge technologies. Uh, like uh, fintech uh, and others, uh, but uh, uh, we uh, have to have a very balanced uh, real economy and uh, uh, digital economies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not the right answer, but yeah. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, so if I can put Susan on the spot now, what is China doing about inclusiveness in the digital economy? You mentioned in Beijing, things are way in advance, but is that a concern for the Chinese government that the rural versus urban, the old versus the young are being separated by the digital economy? I would say yes. And even you know, the, uh, taking the uh, senior people as an example, they may not be able to shop online. They may not be uh, even able to hire taxi online. I think this is like a, I think two, uh, three issues that need to be addressed. One is the awareness, you know, to know that there is a new form of employing the so-called e-commerce or digital trade. Second is the trust, you know, for senior people to asking them for their uh, bank account number and also link on the, uh, with the app. That's really a hard work to, you have to do. Thirdly, is the convenience of uh, the, uh, the devices or software easy to learn, easy to use. So these three aspects, I think first of first, like uh, awareness, it should be a joint effort from both the private sector and the governmental sector. Second, for the trustworthy issue, I think there's more like uh, the privacy, uh, the, the private sector issues. And the, uh, the application uh, development, no matter from the software perspective or hardware perspective, I think like, uh, it's, let leave it. I think in China, the problem is not the uh, government doing less, it's actually it does too much. So leave it to the private sector. And uh, I think uh, Chinese uh, private uh, companies can do a, a very good, excellent job, actually. So that's my, uh, for the, the domestic level. Actually, when we talk about digital, I think like, uh, especially when Zia in the beginning uh, mentioned it's the international trade. It's actually trade easily across border, especially with the digital trade. Uh, we have like, uh, we can shop uh, from China on Amazon or on other uh, uh, e-commerce platform outside of China, or even people outside of China can shop on the uh, uh, Taobao or on Jingdong, you know, the other platform. So we're talking about the, uh, the uh, interna traditional international trade, where we're talking about like a custom issue, tariff issue, uh, like uh, examining or a quarantine issue. But we also talk about cross-border data transfer uh, and also security issue. And this needs, really needs international consensus. Like the TPP you mentioned, we know that OECD is making efforts. We are knowing that uh, uh, APEC is making efforts. So this is another level of uh, effort. That's uh, not only individual uh, company or individual 
country, but actually international effort. Thank you very much. So that would be a whole other panel. Maybe we should, can all stay for another hour. We'll do another panel on that. <laughs> what, what I'll do right now is open up to Q&A, and I'm going to collect a, a whole bunch of questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Somebody break the ice, please. Who's the first question? If somebody asked the second question. I can ask the first one. <laughs> Who wants to ask the second question? <laughs> Just teasing. Somebody raise their hand here. Come on. You guys are all interesting topics. OK, so I'll, I'll ask. OK, there we go. There we go, please. Maybe I could get a couple of perspectives from the panelists. Uh, the problem in digitizing trade is it, is it technology is it governance, is it data, is it something else? You know, just, just a quick perspective, um, which, which is the, the largest problem that, you know, needs to be solved to get real, real world outcomes here? My, Michael from Swift, by the way. Perfect. Sorry, Japanese colleague. Who would you point that to? Maybe Professor, <laughs> start. Professor Lee, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. Who's next? I saw another hand. No? Okay, please, here. Thank you. Uh, so my question is to Professor Lee and also... Oh, uh, my God. <laughs> also Mrs. Ning. Uh, uh, because I know, like, uh, in China, Alibaba have launched the EWTP uh, for the digital trade. I'm just interesting to know, like, what's your view on that and how you think that will change the global landscape if they are going to have an impact. Yeah. Here we go. Please. Hi. Um, I'm uh, Arun Sundarajan from New York University. Um, so this isn't to any particular panelist, uh, um, but just to sort of anyone who wants to answer. But I mean, uh, a, a critical aspect of uh, sort of world stability that comes up from increased digitization of tra trade is that um, it, it, it seems to increase the fragility of, um, of, of, of the world economy because of these sort of digital inter interdependences that like, you know, companies have on one another. And so you sort of open yourself up to the possibility that say a security breach in one company can have sort of ripple effects, like, you know, across, like, you know, um, companies that are not just within the country that like, you know, the breach occurred, but like, you know, uh, companies that this company's computers are connected to. So I'm wondering if you've thought about like, you know, steps that we can take to sort of understand the increased sort of fragility of the world economy that is caused by the digital trade and uh, potential steps that we can take to sort of mitigate like, you know, this, 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 this sort of a problem that comes from interdependence and potential contagion. Contagion, yeah. Thank you very much. One more, please, here. Yeah, it's uh, Saviru Budu, lawyer from Becker McKenzie. Uh, I think it is clear that now governments are struggling in understanding how to, to find the right balance between uh, allowing uh, free data flows uh, in order to support companies and uh, at the same time protect uh, the personal data of citizens. So my question is, uh, uh, do you think that uh, companies uh, operating in countries where there is a, a very weak uh, uh, legal data protection framework uh, basically have uh, a competitive advantage in comparison with, uh, for example, companies running uh, uh, activities in Europe where we have GDPR at the moment? That's a very interesting question. Okay, so I'm gonna go, we, we really do have to end at 45, so what I wanna do is go back to the panel and we'll start with, uh, with you, you were the most popular to start with, but we'll, we'll all add in as well, that's, uh, please. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a very good question, but, but I cannot answer you directly. But I think uh, I want to mention two points to maybe maybe it's useful for, for your question. I think it's also um, it's very, very uh, 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 you know that now uh, if we want to to just like the mission we, we committed to improve the state of the world, you know, for digital is very useful, but. Now the you know the, the penetration rate in the world is only fifty percent, and even in China, the, our internet penetration rate is only fifty six percent. That means there is another three billion people cannot 
connect the internet, and another 600 million people in China cannot access the internet. So the first key point, how to make sure we can increase the internet penetration rate. And the rest of people is lower of education, maybe it's in a rural area and or maybe have a lower income. So how to make sure we can provide the, the, some new technologies with lower barrier for them to connect the internet and also increase the security because maybe they have lower knowledge how to protect themselves. So we should make sure that we can have a very secure infrastructure and very secure applications or something else. So that's the key, first key point to increase that and how to implement that and how to make sure the current, current digital trade can be protected. We really need a global collaboration platform. But I don't think that the current platform can do this. Even I, I remember that in one month ago that the United Nations built a new uh, high-level panel for digital uh, collaboration, something else, I think. But now I, I, I never seen some organization can take this rule to lead the global collaboration. I think it's maybe the forum, maybe something else, but we really, really need that. Even the United Nations have a lot of discussion for Internet Governance Forum, but they only talk and talk. So, so we really need to do something. I, I really want to call for action to build something, a global collaboration platform to do, do the things. And uh, the, for the second question, I, I think I kind of speak a lot for the EWTP and for, for Alibaba, but I think that it should be good. Should be, we should get more uh, entrepreneur and the big internet company to get involved in the governance issues. Yeah, because they have interest for the business, but they need to contribute more, even the money or, or resource, human resource for knowledge or pra best practice, just like Swift, I think Swift give, can give the best practice for that. And also for, for Alibaba, even their partners for the EWDP, that their partners, their members can contribute more, not only for money, but also for the best, best practice should be better. And then I need more time for others. Thank you. Yeah. Let me just follow up on that. It, is the one bridge, one road thing it have a digital component to increase yes. the digital yes. penetration? Okay. They, they really have that. Okay. okay. Good. Thanks. Anybody want to tackle world stability for Jill? Or you want to please just jump in? Uh, I think that your question, your question, and your question uh, have one thing in common, which is related to, to governance. In the end of the day, the, the, the main obstacle, the main challenge is, is governance, uh, the governance of the internet. Uh, that's, that's, that's what we have to do. But uh, however, it's, as I said before, it's not neutral. Who will do that, how, and with what purpose? That's, that's the, uh, the, the, the quick, uh, the, the very key question. Uh, I think that, uh, to put it in short, I think that we need a kind of a Bretton Woods on the, on the digital economy. Excellent. Um, let me just ask that there was one very specific thing, which I think is a really interesting question is, is there dumping on data standards? So in essence, have the Europeans tied themselves up so that they'll no longer be the future of platforms because they have such difficult things, whereas say the US has anything happens, they get an advantage. Do you, you who, who deal with the technology, do you feel that there can be something like dumping by low, low standards. In, in Europe, we use the word social dumping, that a, a country has low standards on, say, pensions or maternity leave, and that, that gives them a competitive advantage, and it's unfair in some sense. Do you think that exists in the digital world, digital standards, race to the bottom kind of stuff? That's a hard, so it was, it was a very good question. Nobody knows the answer. Um, I, if I can take a guess, I would say that it may actually be the exactly the other way around, that it creates a, a niche that you respect certain uh, rules and only the platforms or people can respect those rules. In essence, it's protectionism because, you know, if, if you, like, I, I run a site in Europe, Vox EU, and we've had to adopt everything to match the, the GDPR thing. And the, Europe, the American sites don't necessarily have that already, and they're not in trouble for it yet. But potentially, that gives us an advantage because we do that. But uh, I just leave that. But, the, but remember that the, the GPR, maybe the, the regulation from other countries maybe make the internet to be fragmented again, yeah. maybe worse. So we need, we need to consider that very, very seriously. 
But, yes, please. Yeah, GDPR actually, I think that it's called the most uh, uh, like a rigid uh, the, the data protection policies in the world, in the human history, kind of. But first of all, I think it, I'm not uh, like uh, advocating, I just say like my understanding because we have helping clients to do the GDPR compliance. Uh, I think first of all, it's a promoting single market within EU. Second, it's a actually exporting, it's a standard of protection towards the others. Uh, just because uh, it, it has the rule say, like if it's tra like a, a transmitted to the third party, and then the third party or the country should have the same adequate level of protection mm. before it could be transferred. Actually, export the standard. That's why the American company, even Chinese companies, are doing the GDPR compliance. So I think that uh, uh, it is rigid, and it, will, it has been criticized a lot uh, for restrictions of because of the rigid protection, actually restrict the innovation, the use, free use of the data, mm. uh, which is actually the new uh, energy, new uh, petroleum, uh, petrol, petroleum for the new economy. Uh, so I, I agree in that. But yeah. Sorry. I, I want to really, answer that. One of the, the only thing okay. I really have to do is close <laughs> <laughs> exactly on time. And, you know, in, in Davos, they have the bell, they ring. So the bell has rung, and we have to end here. As usual, it was too interesting. Our panelists were too fantastic. We ran out of time. So let's join, join me in giving them a big hand. Thank you very much.